Welcome. Welcome to probably the most ironic. Point the thing up in the air. Yes, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to probably the most ironic observance of the year. As John Ivan said this morning, Armistice Day is a day to celebrate peace. So what are we doing here? We don't have peace. Armistice Day was born out of the total revulsion at the insanity of war, yet decades of celebrating Armistice Day was not enough to prevent World War II. So here we are, just a few people up against a juggernaut of hundreds of billions of dollars from the largest military power in the world. What are we doing? We're here to make peace. So um, digest the irony and see if you can come up with something productive for it. We're very, very glad to see you today. And the sunshine is a good omen. I hope everybody has gotten a little program. Um, we'll try to keep this very short, very sweet. Uh, the program has uh, the little agenda of the speeches and on the back, the words to um, our song that we will sing at the end, led by Gene and Susan. But first off, I would like to introduce Paul Appel. member of Veterans for Peace 161 from Altona, Illinois. Paul. Armistice Day celebrates the end of the war to end all wars. It does not enable the next war to be more easily waged by celebrating the soldiers sacrificed in war. As the bells were still ringing in celebration of the end of World War I, the mother of 25-year-old Wilfred Owen received the black-bordered War Office tele telegram telling her that a week earlier her son had been killed in action. In his notebooks, Owen left the world what many consider the greatest war the In the poem, on from his experience in the villages, writes the reason why I cannot bring myself to celebrate those that gave their lives in war. Not just World War I, but all wars, including America's war in Vietnam, in which I was a participant. Owen wrote, My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old line, Dulcet de Columbus pro patria moria. How sweet and fitting it is to give one's life for one's country. I could not tell the lie to comfort the suffering mom after I told her that her only son had been killed in Vietnam. I could not write the lie to give comfort to the parents of one of my men killed in Vietnam. I cannot perpetuate the lie by marching in Veterans Day's parades. As Owen's good friend and fellow war veteran, Siegfried Sassoon wrote in his poem, Suicide in the Trenches, You smug-faced crowds with kindly eye, who cheer when soldier lads march by, sneak home and pray you'll never know the hell where youth and laughter go.
Thank you, Paul. I'd like to introduce Scott Roser. Scott is a member of VFP 161. Scott? Every Veterans Day, one of the Bible verses that gets thrown around quite a bit is John 15, 13. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. What are people implying when they employ this verse on Veterans Day? Do they mean that all veterans are willing to die for each other? When I went to Iraq in the Air Force, I was not willing to sacrifice myself for anyone I served with. A few of the people were nice, but many of them were assholes. <laughs> I was sent there to build bombs, and that's exactly what I did. I know that some of them were used to incinerate the enemy. Many of these people who were the enemy attacked our base because they were poor farmers and they were forced to do so by insurgents, but we killed them all the same. In fact, no one on base was willing to risk very much at all, which is why we had a robotic predator drone do all the killing for us. If anyone deserves a medal this Veterans Day, it's the robots. If this Bible verse is instead referring to people back home, well then sure, I guess I would have been willing to sacrifice my life for my fiance and my family. But did I really need to travel thousands of miles to drop a $50,000 bomb to incinerate some dude that can't afford a toothbrush? Was this guy really going to buy a plane ticket from America and hurt my family? I do not think that Jesus' words in the Gospel of John should ever be applied to veterans. Jesus was talking about his love for his disciples and for the love that he wanted them to have for each other. Keep in mind that Jesus lived in an impoverished Middle Eastern country that was occupied by a powerful foreign empire. Sound familiar? But again and again, he told his disciples that violence is not the way. At the end, when the soldiers came for Jesus, Peter tried to defend him with the sword, but Jesus rebuked him. Those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. I care very much for veterans who have been traumatized by war in any way. And I certainly hope they will find forgiveness and healing. But as a Christian, and as a veteran, and an American, I will not endorse the myths and the lies that have led so many Americans to be killed uh, next, I would like to introduce Jim Throgmorton, one of the newest re-elected members of the uh, Iowa City Council and hopefully uh, to be our next mayor. Uh, he has a past life uh, involving Germany and Army and tanks. Jim, glad for you to speak. Great, thanks. So, hi, it's great to be here. It's really wonderful to see so many friends. How many of you are veterans? All right, a whole bunch of us. When I think about the past, what, 100 years, I think World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the First Iraq War, the The only question we need to ask really is do we want this to continue for another hundred years? I think the answer has got to be no. So we do what we can. Thank you to Ned and anybody else affiliated with this group for doing everything they can. So it's great to be here. Bravo. Uh, it's almost 11 o'clock. Before it gets to another shell, we've got uh, time for a, a couple words. Yeah. Shell Strong, a hero. Um, I just wanted on this Armistice Day to uh, remember the what I call the other veterans. That is, the veterans who opposed the war, who refused service, who were conscientious objectors or draft resistors, and who paid a heavy price for taking that stand. I'm thinking of people like Eamon Hennessy in World War I, who served more than two years in jail and who was uh, basically starved in prison for taking the stands he did. I'm thinking of people like Don Laughlin, who's here, who went to prison during World War II rather than go and kill people. I'm also thinking about someone named Steve Smith, 
whom you may, whose name you may not know, but who was the first college student on any campus in the country to burn his draft card because he refused to go to Vietnam and kill. And I'm thinking about Steve Marsden, whom we just lost, who was a, a terrific uh, a resistor and a man of conscience, uh, who opposed war consistently over the course of, of his life. So I just hope we remember those veterans today as well. Bells ring at 11 o'clock. We are part of history. Let's the bells ring uh, for peace. And as we stand in silence, thinking about the need for no more needless killing and deaths. It says Joe Hossie, PFP 163. But uh, Joe has his substitute, Mark Ricky. Mark, welcome. I do want to say that Clark is one of those people that the last fellow just talked about. Clark avoided going to Vietnam because he was totally against it. Good day, good armistice day. I'm an associate member of Veterans for Peace, the Lynn County chapter. Today I want to take a few minutes to explain an alternative voting system called instant runoff voting. Can you hear me? No. You got to use that one. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Some of you will remember back in the election of 2000 when some voters who wanted a small smaller military budget voted their conscience and voted for Nader. Remember how our voting system rewarded Nader voters? It gave them their third choice, Bush. We need a voting system that does not reward third party voters by giving them their third choice. Instant runoff voting eliminates this problem, and eliminates peacemakers and all voters to vote their conscience with their first choice vote. For example, back in 2000, Nader received 3,000 votes nationally, and Bush and Gore virtually tied at 47.5% each. Nader received 95,000 votes in Florida, and the Supreme Court case ruled on 5,000 or less questionable votes in Florida. Because our current two-party only voting system has no runoff, our standard for victory is with instant runoff voting, the second choice of Nader voters could have been counted and to determine which candidate the majority preferred, and I bet most of us believe Nader would have been the strong favorite. 
by recording second choice votes and instant runoff voting system, peacemakers will be liberated to support a third party peacemaking candidate. A second benefit is less negative ads. When there is a three-way or multi-party race and there will be an instant runoff to determine the majority winner, candidates will need a second choice vote to be a majority winner. Running a negative ad will most likely go against the goal of winning second choice votes. Instead, candidates will now have an incentive to forthrightly explain both how they are different but also how they were, are similar to other candidates and how a candidate could work together in a constructive and accountable coalition with another candidate. This is a significant improvement over running a negative ad against the only other party, which is what we currently have in our two-party only system. Thanks for listening. I have handouts that give links to more information on alternative voting systems. Right with Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, thanks. Thanks for taking the action that you did 48 years ago. It changed my life. We all need to listen to heroes that don't have statues. We need statues for those heroes, too. Yeah, well, that would be fine. <laughs> Kennedy said that once. Yes, uh, yes, John F. Kennedy said in a letter to one of his Navy compatriots, he said, um, there's going to be more wars until we give the same honor to conscientious objectors as we do to soldiers. There's a lot there's a lot to consider in the life of John F. Kennedy and especially his last year and a half. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce John Jadria, who is my boss as the president of Veterans for Peace 161. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. As you know, Ed really runs the show. I'm just a pretty big. <laughs> you're very beautiful. Thank you. So if you're a veteran and you don't already belong to Veterans for Peace, I encourage you to join us. If you're a non-veteran and you believe in what we do, I encourage you to join us. But I have another message. That is, so many veterans that I've talked to don't appreciate being thanked for their service. Many of us have contributed in some way to the demise of other human beings, often to civilians. And, and the role we played in the, in the military, although we didn't intend it to be this way, was our full of destruction of many. And so and, and we have mixed feelings when people say, thank you for your service. But we've all made a sacrifice. Even if, even if that sacrifice was just being away in another land or away from our families for a long period of time, we've paid some price. My, my message to you is to, instead of asking or telling veterans, thanks for your service, how about instead, thanks for your sacrifice? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again very much for being here. Um, as I hope most of you know, immediately after this observance, uh, we will be having uh, a party, a peace party, at the Iowa City Public Library at Meeting Room A. Um, there will be a lot of socializing, a lot of free pizza, <coughs> no beer, and an opportunity for open mic. So if you haven't had a chance to speak today out here, uh, please come to the library afterwards and uh, get to visit with all of the people that you see around you here. Get some good pizza and tell the world what you think. Before we close, I wanted to say a couple more things about Armistice Day and then I will ask Gene Littlejohn uh, to lead us in a song, which you have on the back of your little uh, quarter page sheet. Uh, if you don't have one, uh, get Mary Martin has got something.
but as I think of, as I think of uh, why do we do this on Armistice Day, uh, it is really simple. It's an affirmation from us that it's actually is possible. The, we, we are trying our best to supply the country with an antidote to the addiction to endless war. Ironically, so many people don't even realize that we are engaged in endless war, that we're engaged in the longest war in U.S. history. Uh, people are not aware that what we spend our money on is war. They call it the Department of Defense, but we haven't had a war of national defense since World War II, and that can be a whole other area of discussion after this observance. But how ironic to call it Department of Defense when our wars of the last 70 years have been wars of interference in the affairs of other nations that have killed many, many more civilians than soldiers. So as we leave here today, I would encourage people not to leave in despair, but to leave in hope. We all know that peace is not going to happen like manna from heaven. But we also know in common sense that peace is never going to happen unless we really want it. You know, and, and even that takes maybe a commitment. Do you want peace? Yes! yes. Then if you do, then we have to figure out how to work for it. We have to figure out, each one of us, what we can do. Um, we each maybe have different things that we can do, but let's not go home and not do anything. Become informed, become agitated, become irritated, and become active. Thank you so very much for being here. And thank you. Thank you, man. And, 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 and please come on over to the public library afterwards. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Gene Littlejohn, Gene, and Ross Porch, with the help of Susan Spears, are going to uh, lead us in. Last night I had the strangest dream. And before you start, I have to tell you that Gene Littlejohn is famous for being the leader of the Family Folk Machine. And the Family Folk Machine is an absolutely wonderful organization. Right, Atticus? <laughs> and we will be performing at the Senior Center on this Sunday, and we'll be performing at the Senate Chamber of Old Capitol on the following Sunday on the 22nd. Enough for introduction. So Ross is going to give us an intro, and then we'll come in nice and strong.
want it? No. Do we want peace? Yes. When do we want it? No. Do we want peace? Yes. When do we want it? No. Do we want peace? Yes. When do we want it? No.